Warning, this video contains major spoilers for Morningstar. A video that I've looked forward to making for a long time is one that ranks the greatest Razor Masters in the Red Rising series. At the moment, I can't make such a list while including the Warriors of the Iron Gold era, at least until Red God's release, but I believe that talking about the most talented fighters while sticking to just the original trilogy makes for some interesting speculation and discussion. I'll be providing the ranking of who I believe the top five warriors in the first three books of the Red Rising series are, and going into some of my sources and reasoning for how exactly I've placed them. I'll have to perform some serious speculation and analysis in a few places that are definitely up to interpretation, so this may end up a fairly personal list, and I'd love to see any discussion or disagreements you have in the comments. There will be an extensive honorable mention section before I reveal the number one Razor Master, which will include both those who I think just barely don't make the top five, and those who could have possibly done so but simply lack the physical feats and duels to properly justify their potential placement. To avoid ruining the suspense of how exactly each color on this list is ranked, I'll hold off on discussing the specifics of certain duels until I reach the higher ranked member of any given contest in the story. So, with all of that out of the way, let's get into the number 5 spot. Coming in at number 5 is Cassius Al Bologna, Morning Knight of the Society and favorite son of House Bologna. Cassius was always a talented swordsman as he grew up, and Darrow once noted the fact that he has devastated his opponents since childhood, because his enemies fight like him, but slower. Even before the events of Morning Star, he was already an incredible warrior. This could be observed through his feats of tearing through Luna's dueling circuit undefeated, and at the end of Golden Sun by killing Fitchner, though this was later confirmed in the Iron Gold series to have been done with Aja's help. While those feats were noteworthy, and contribute to the merit of his placement on this list, I believe it's most fair to consider his prime form in the trilogy. This would have been during the events of Morning Star, after receiving tutelage from Aja Al Grimace in The Willow Way. I find it a consistent metric in the series to scale a character's fighting ability by whether or not they have taken down an Olympic Knight. Cassius further eclipsed this qualifier by taking down both the armored Truth Knight and fending off the Joy Knight, all while unarmored himself in the Dragon Maw. In this same scene, he took the lead in holding off Asha alongside Darrow and Mustang. And while a 3v1 may not seem like the greatest accolade one could be awarded, it was against a fully armored Asha, so I believe this counts for more than a little. Cassius was clearly one of the greatest classical swordsmen of this era, and was renowned throughout the series for his fighting prowess. The fact that he is coming in at the bottom of this list should say a lot about those that I've chosen to rank above him. Just above Cassius, in the number 4 spot, I'm going to go with Darrow of Lycos, the Reaper of Mars and the Red who broke the Gold Empire. It's difficult to list the extensive achievements and feats of Darrow, so I'll try and make it as concise as possible with a few qualifications and notable acts that I find solidly placing me here. Darrow combined the speed and dexterity of the youngest Helldiver of Lycos in living memory with a carved body far beyond that of the average gold in strength and durability. Darrow was quite literally handcrafted by one of the greatest violet carvers alive to be a god of war for the rising, and to climb to the top of gold society in all physical and martial matters. Darrow's prime form in the trilogy would have been during Golden Sun, after he received his training in the Willow Way from the former rage knight Lauren Al Arcos. He combined this training with an unorthodox fighting style compared to the usual gold cravat to become a fighter particularly suited for killing golds. His greatest feats in this state included his humiliating defeat of Cassius in their duel at the Luna Summit, killing an armored Carnus Albolono while he himself was unarmored and utterly exhausted, and taking down 12 armed greys with just a razor and a tattered scarab skin. In one of his weakest states, Darrow survived Aja in the 3v1 alongside Cassius and Mustang without armor and missing his right hand. For almost any other fighter in the series, a match involving Aja without your dominant hand seems like it would be an immediate death sentence. His feats in his post-box state during Morningstar are a bit difficult to consider, as he was significantly less capable than before the Jackal's torture. For example, until Virginia Augustus's intervention, he was losing quite decisively to Cassius at the South Pole of Mars, someone he had decimated in their previous duel. This also brings about one problem in the ranking. Darrow in his prime from Golden Sun didn't end up facing Cassius in his prime after training with Aja, so we lack a precise contest for ranking the two of them. 
When it comes to placing Darrow above Cassius, I believe that, despite Cassius having grown up with a blade and receiving tutoring in the will away from Aja, Darrow's abilities and training with Lorne overshadowed Cassius' trilogy peak. Darrow seems to have had a much more dedicated training period with Lorne than Cassius likely would have had access to with Aja due to their duties as Olympic Knights. In addition, not assuming that she wouldn't make a great teacher, but Aja was expressly noted as the greatest student of the greatest Razor Master the society has ever known. I think this is a clear distinction between the capabilities of teacher versus student, and from this one could assume Darrow had the superior education. At their best, Darrow and Cassius were neck and neck by the end of the trilogy, and I think an argument could be made for either of them overtaking the other. For me personally, Darrow just has the accomplishments and circumstances to place him above Cassius in this ranking. To surpass Razor Masters, like our two previous spots, it takes someone who was revered as a living god among his people. That's why rank 3 is none other than Ragnar Valaris, the Shield of Tinos and Prince of the Valkyrie Spires. One may contest the title of Razor Master for Ragnar, as he never had formal training with the weapon. If I wanted to maintain accuracy, I would change the title of this video to be the top 5 fighters or warriors, which I am using fairly interchangeably. I prefer the title of Razor Master, as it is more specific to the in-universe etymology, and despite lacking classical training, Ragnar is clearly a master of all manners of weaponry. Before the saga, Ragnar survived the Way of Stains, a deadly test that he believed not even Darrow was ready to take. And after that, he fought for two decades as a slave knight gladiator for Magnus Algrimus against fellow obsidian and wild animals. By the time we met him in Golden Sun, Ragnar was capable of single-handedly killing a squad of four golds, six obsidian, and ten greys, using ion blades instead of a razor. While we may not know the exact caliber of the golds he slew in that instance, though we might assume fairly high as they were leading a squad to take the Bridge of the Pax, we do know of some incredibly notable peerless scarred that he took down. In the astral battle above Europa, Ragnar led a small squad of greys and obsidian and killed six Bologna blade dancers. The Bologna being a family so versed in war that their children learned the sword before they learned to read. His most impressive feat came during the Lion's Reign, when he cut down the Wind Knight and almost cut down Cassius. While his defeat of the Wind Knight is a clear metric of skill in having killed an Olympic, the wording regarding his contest with Cassius is somewhat ambiguous. What I take from the wording of almost cut down, given that he succeeded in opening the gates and taking Aegea, is that he was successfully besting Cassius, which then prompted Cassius to flee the battle before he was killed or otherwise incapacitated. It is also worth noting that when Ragnar killed the Wind Knight and supposedly bested Cassius, it was his first time ever wielding a razor, as it had just been given to him by Darrow during the Lion's Reign. In this light, Ragnar showed a prodigious skill against two knights who had trained with the weapon for their entire lives, and who knows what he could have been capable of if he had ever had the opportunity to train with a master such as Lorne. There are less feats in Morningstar that I'll list here, but a particularly notable one is when Ragnar took on Kavax and Daxo out of Telamonus at the same time, and was getting the better of them before their fight was interrupted. Ragnar showed himself capable on numerous occasions of taking down multiple Peerless Scarred at once, but to go more than even with two Telemonuses, an Apex Gold Bloodline, is a considerable achievement. For another one of his more mythical feats, he was swallowed by a carved sea monster during a Howler mission for the Sons of Ares and cut his way out of the thing from the inside. Despite a couple of duels that land his place on this list above Cassius, and below one of the higher ranked members, Ragnar's ranking requires precision, as it identifies the clear difference between Razor Masters with certain levels of training and experience. His placement above Darrow comes from a handful of reasons. To greatly oversimplify the characteristics that I'm considering the most on this list, I would break it down into strength, speed, and dexterity, or skill. I would describe Darrow as well above average in all of those categories. He often overwhelmed opponents with the strength of his carved and trained body the speed of his days as a red hell diver and a dancer, and the dexterity of his training with Lorne and his time operating a claw drill. While Ragnar lacked the dexterity coming from proper kinesthetic training with a Razor Master, he was a monster in the other two categories. When it came to strength, he killed a squad of greys simply by running through them, and easily lifted weights that Darrow and Victra couldn't budge. When it came to speed, he was noted by Darrow as being disturbingly fast and smooth in his movement, which was especially disconcerting given his gargantuan size. 
I believe that the extremes Ragnar reached in the categories of strength and speed overshadow the ability of a fighter on the level of Darrow, who had the edge over Ragnar only in dexterity. Even more so because Darrow tended to rely on the edge he had in all of those areas, and tended to struggle against those who were faster and stronger than him, or who weren't thrown off by his unorthodox fighting style. This ultimately lands Ragnar above Darrow and Cassius on my ranking. One of the most complicated placements on this ranking comes from the single most famous character in universe, a character who had an entire biography written on his life, accomplishments, and philosophy that it seemed most golds of the society had read. The number two spot goes to Lauren Arcos, the stone side, a man who held the position of Rage Knight for 60 years and the greatest Razor Master the society had ever known. Lauren's ranking is quite difficult for a number of reasons. While he was quite active in the Martian Civil War during Golden Sun, we just don't have many of the same kinds of feats that we got for other members of this list. His reputation was also largely based on his campaigns and achievements as a younger man, which presents two problems. One is that those achievements didn't result in many direct contests and duels with the warriors of the modern era, and the other is that Lorne was past his prime. We have no real way of measuring prime Lorne, and this list is focusing on warriors best during the time of the trilogy so we'll be considering Old Man Lauren as best we can while still factoring in some of his younger achievements. I'll also be using details from the number one ranked individual on this list to justify Lauren's placement, but I'll save those for when we get to number one. Likely his most notable feat was Lauren's invention and mastery of the Willow Way, the most famous form of cravat and razor fighting in the trilogy. So far we've talked about the overwhelming strength of fighters like Darrow and Ragnar, but the Willow Way emphasized circular motion and using the force of your enemy to create new angles. This would have made an utter master of the form like Lorne particularly suited to beating our two previous ranks. A clear metric that Darrow gave for capability with a razor is something called an onset, and he helpfully outlined the placement of Lorne and Cassius when describing this. He explained how a very good killer can string together a set of three moves in an onset, a one second set of pre-programmed carefully cultivated strikes everyone has their signature. As one of the top 50 with a blade in the core, Cassius could do 5. I once saw Lauren do 8. Not only does this demonstrate Lauren's martial supremacy over even a fighter like Cassius, but this was a feat of Lauren as an older man, since Darrow witnessed it himself, which gives us one of our few direct comparisons between Lauren and a modern Razor Master. Since I have to save some specifics on Lauren's placement until the number one spot, I'll leave off with just a few more anecdotes and small feats of his. When Lorne murdered Tactus in Retribution at his estate on Europa, he moved so quickly with an eye on Dagger that Darrow couldn't even react to the motion, and he described that movement as faster than a hummingbird's wing. A Blue Bologna pilot whose ship Lorne boarded during the Martian Civil War described him in a corridor as Death Incarnate. When the Augustans were exposing the trainer Pliny, Lorne held back a room of 100 golds with his reputation and a single threat alone also demonstrating his precision in that instance by being able to tell how close anyone got to Darrow down to a decimeter. And finally, Nera Augustus claimed to have personally seen Lorne kill a stained without a razor. It is my belief that Lorne in his prime would be at the top of this list, and his feats at the age of 100 still confidently earn him second place on my ranking. Before we get into the number one spot, I'd like to briefly go into some honorable mentions. It's my personal belief that this top 5 would remain the same even if some of the members I'll list here had more feats to scale them, but it isn't fair to definitively make that claim without acknowledging that they lack the same metric the others on this ranking received. Our first honorable mention is Fitchner Albarca. If this were a top 10 list, I would probably rank him as number 6. Fitchner was a warrior acknowledged by both Aja and Octavia, and defeated Proctor Jupiter and Apollonius Alvali Irath for the Rage Knight post. Additionally, alongside Cassius, he defeated two stained and captured our next mention. Nero Augustus was certainly depicted as much more of a politician than a warrior. However, he received one incredible moment to shine in a hollow of his failed raid on the Ganymede docks. He gracefully killed a squad of a dozen greys and then defeated the Hearth Knight in single combat, before it took two other Olympics to restrain him, those two Olympics being Cassius and Aja, who were arguably the greatest knights of their order at that time. Virginia Augustus was depicted similarly to her father as more of a political creature, 
though she got a few more chances to show off her incredible fighting capabilities. She overpowered Darrow in his post-box state, and survived the 3v1 alongside Darrow and Cassius against Aja. She was highly capable as both a tactician and a warrior, despite her greater strength lying in her political abilities. Someone else who would certainly make a top 10 for the trilogy is Victra Aujuliae. She was clearly depicted as an apex peerless scarred, with constant showcases and mentions of her superior Juliae genetics. She pushed the same weights while training with Darrow during their recovery from the Jackal's torture. She fought right alongside Darrow, Sephi, and the Valkyrie when taking the Colossus, and she punched a dent into Holiday T. Nakamura's armor that was meant to handle railgun rounds. She unfortunately just lacks the feats and duels to merit more than an honorable mention in a top 5, though she does get more opportunities to showcase her abilities in the Iron Gold Tetralogy. Kavax and Daxo Aotalamanus are another case of an incredible martial bloodline, and were on the front lines of the space engagements, both above the ambush at Europa and during the Lion's Reign on Mars. Unfortunately, their only Razor combat we got to see was when the two of them faced down Ragnar. They appeared to be slowly losing to him despite it being a two-on-one, which is hardly room for scaling. I do think, with proper metrics, that Daxo could merit a surprising place on at least a top 10 given some of his actions in the sequel series, but I can't take that into account here. Sephi Valaris, the Queen of the Valkyrie, had some notable accomplishments during the Solar War, but despite her vital role in the success of the Rising and a frontline position taking the Colossus with Daron Victra, she is simply yet another case of lacking fighting feats in the trilogy. My last honorable mention is Severo Albarca, and he's a bit of a unique case. No one can deny that Severo was incredibly deadly, and it would be a bit odd to make a ranking solely on formal dueling settings. Pierce himself has made some distinctions in Reddit AMAs as to certain fighters having the upper hand under certain circumstances. Darrow observed that Severo was the best zero gravity fighter he had ever seen, so who knows how Severo would match up against any of our top five under unique conditions. He did kill Aja Algrimis, however at that point it was a 4v1, and it seems pretty difficult to use that for any scaling, so he'll have to remain in honorable mentions for now. At this point, I'm sure that even someone who hasn't read the series will easily be able to guess the top spot on this list. I am confidently naming the number one Razor Master in the Red Rising trilogy as Aja Algrimis, the Protean Knight and personal killer of Sovereign Octavia Aulun. I think the only room for discussion here would be a comparison between Prime Lorn and Aja, and how that would affect a comparison between her and Old Man Lorn. He was labeled by Darrow as the greatest Razor Master the society has ever known and he also noted that Lauren didn't teach Aja everything that he knew. These two statements open the floor to discussion on Prime Lauren versus Aja. However, I think there's more than enough evidence supporting her state in the trilogy era as having surpassed the older Lorens. I'll boil it down to three main points of evidence. The first is that Lauren was consistently depicted as quite old and implied to be past his prime, whereas Aja was at the height of her physical abilities and quite in practice from her active duties as Protean Knight. While she was 50 or so years old, Golds still seemed to be in their prime at that age, while Lorne was over 100 and showing signs of that age with his popping joints and audible groans from physical discomforts. The second point is how Lorne talked about potentially crossing razors with Aja when they met on Europa. While he did say to Darrow, leave Aja to me, you'll have better luck against the Stained, his tone here indicated little confidence in being able to defeat her. At best, it was somewhat up to chance, which is fair at that level of combat, as Pierce has previously indicated. But more likely, it seems that he hoped to either hold out long enough for Darrow to finish off the Stained and then join him against Aja, or was grimly hoping to succeed on whatever chance he did have. The final point comes from one of Lauren's own maxims, in which he stated, Never fight a river, and never fight Aja. Of course, the clear reference to Aja as a force of nature makes sense as a warning to anyone else, but Lauren's sayings weren't just advice for others. They always appeared to be based on how he himself viewed and approached life and war, so one would imagine this statement applied to himself as well. I wouldn't consider this one of my main points of evidence, but it's also worth noting the opinion of Nero Augustus when it came to a contest between the two. When Darrow described the impossibility of getting to Octavia Alun while in a room with Aja, Nero stated that even Lorne wouldn't have dared to attempt such a thing. Ultimately, we never got a direct contest between the two to put aside any contention, but the evidence does seem overwhelmingly in Aja's favor if we look exclusively at the time of the trilogy. 
I mentioned before that we would be using the number one spot to further justify Lauren's placement, specifically as it comes just above Ragnar's. This is another duel that we didn't get, but I believe by using one of Otter's greatest feats that can be applied to Lorne, the placement ends up justified. This feat was, of course, when Aja infamously killed Ragnar in single combat at the South Pole of Mars. The fight began with Ragnar hurling one of his razors at Aja, who, in one of the most terrifying and badass moments in the series, managed the inhuman feat of catching it out of the air. After an initial engagement between Ragnar, Aja, Cassius, and Darrow, the four split off into their respective one-on-one -on -one fights. When Darrow caught a glimpse of Aja and Ragnar's fight, he described Aja as peeling Ragnar apart. Though the snow around them was painted entirely with Ragnar's blood, he seemed to temporarily gain some small edge, as Darrow said he was beating her down, overwhelming her, she caves before him now. The difference between the two ultimately didn't come down to pure strength, where Ragnar was dominating. Aja used her experience with razor fighting that Ragnar lacked by engaging the whip function on the weapon, which caused him to swing into the ground. This is something he could have recovered from against most other opponents, but this opening was enough for Aja to land a lethal strike. Let's take a look back at the three categories I mentioned before when ranking Ragnar to finalize our top three. Strength, speed, and dexterity. In simple terms, Ragnar's placement above Darrow and Cassius came from his strength and speed outweighing any advantage the other two may have had in dexterity from their formal training and experience. When comparing him to Aja, he still retained the advantage in strength, though speed seems to either go to Aja, given how she moved against him, or they were neck and neck when it came to this trait. She then completely overwhelmed him in terms of dexterity and razor combat experience, overcoming the difference in strength and any contention around speed. Now I believe we can infer some things from this that make a strong argument for placing Lauren above Ragnar. While Lauren's strength and speed were certainly somewhat diminished by age, we know that it wasn't too considerable a nerf as he moved faster than Darrow could see or react to, and still carved up corridors in the Martian Civil War. Where we can assume he was still incredible, and potentially even greater than Aja, would have been in dexterity and skill with a razor. Since Aja ultimately defeated Ragnar because of her superior dexterity, I think it's fair to say that Lauren could have done the same because of his similar or potentially even greater capacity for that quality. Of course, it is possible that Lauren's diminished strength and speed would have caused Ragnar to overpower him, and that his dexterity wouldn't have been enough, or that his dexterity had decreased with age. We don't know for sure, and never got the contest to be certain, so I think there is an argument for their places being swapped. The deciding factor for me personally was that Ragnar was defeated because of a lack of razor training that Lauren clearly would have had over him, and I find Lauren and Aja similar enough to use Aja's definite placement over Ragnar to do the same with Lauren. Now that I've hashed out the many complexities of the top three, I can begin focusing on the absolute terror that was Aja Algirmas. Aja held one of the most important and powerful positions in the society military, as she was commanding officer of Legio 13 Draconis. This legion was handpicked by Magnus Algrimis and his daughter Aja to act as the Sovereign's personal bodyguards and the very hand of the Sovereign. Aja personally trained many of the Grey Praetorians, most notably Roan T. Flavinius, the most famous Grey alive. Aja performed some of the more ridiculous and noteworthy feats in the series. In Golden Sun, she was able to hear and accurately describe Dara's heartbeat from across a room while people were talking. She also managed impossible escapes into harsh environments that we never really learn exactly how she managed to survive, such as jumping into the sea on Europa to escape the Augustan ambush and falling into a deep icy crevasse at Mars's South Pole. When the Valkyrie later scoured the area for Aja's trail, they found it went deeper, and the blood of some unknown creature was found, which, given that we know Aja survived the ice and made it back to the Sovereign's side, implied her butchering of some wild, carved creature even after the fight with Ragnar and fall into the ice. The fight that has probably been referenced the most on this ranking, as it was relevant to four other characters, was the 3v1 turned 4v1 of Darrow, Cassius, Mustang, and later Severo against Aja. The circumstances of this fight were all over the place. Aja did single-handedly face down and was getting the better of three peerless scarred, two of which are on this list and the other making the honorable mentions, but she did have armor, whereas the other three had none, and Darrow was also missing his dominant hand at that point. Aja took advantage of her ability to survive glancing blows with her armor while dishing out similar ones against the three that they would not have been able to survive given time. The way she fought caused Darrow to observe that it was as if she had studied the battle before it had ever happened. It took a drugged up Severo back from the dead, overloading her with pulse blasts and two razors to finally take down the Protean Knight. 
Over a decade after the events of Morningstar, Azra remained a standard of comparison for the warriors of the Iron Gold era. Without getting into specific spoilers on any characters or scenes this relates to, when one gold managed an onset of seven moves, it was described by another character as matching Lorne and Aja, though without their innate poeticism. An important distinction, as it sets those two apart even as more Razor Masters began to reach a comparable level. Aja was clearly written to be the pinnacle of Razor fighting and physical capabilities in the initial trilogy, and I think there can be no contention as to her belonging at the top of this ranking. Her fantastical feats and terrifying presence throughout the series carved a legacy both in-universe and for readers that has and will last long after her death. Thank you very much for watching. This was a very different type of video from those I've done so far, less of a synopsis of events mixed with analysis and much more heavy on speculation and comparison. If you like this type of video or have any thoughts, please let me know in the comments, as I'm still working out the style and formats of all the videos I intend to do on the series. I would of course love to hear what you agree and disagree with on this ranking in the comments. I think a lot is up in the air, but this is just where the characters landed for me personally. It has been well over a year since I've last uploaded, and that's definitely not a schedule I'm happy with. This series and these videos are some of my greatest passions, but to be fully transparent, my master's degree has just had such huge demands on my time that I can't promise too much in the coming months and years. What I can promise is that I love doing this, and will always come back to it. If you stick around, there will be more, and in the further future, I hope a lot more. Maybe something more than just a passion project and a hobby. In the meantime, I'll keep doing what I can, and I hope you enjoyed and will continue to do so.